absolutely wonderful to be here and to see uh, bright faces so early in the morning. What I'm going to do today is basically help contextualize the movie that you saw uh, yesterday. And in particular, give you a little bit of an idea of why we are doing this. So the genesis of this is quite interesting. Uh, I work with uh, senior leaders around the world, um, you know, uh, at the board level, um, with senior people in government and universities and so on. And uh, as was indicated, so I do a lot of work on strategy and also on how do you execute great strategy. And it's interesting uh, that among other places that I work in, I do a lot of work in Pakistan. Now, many of the leading CEOs there uh, have been my students. And it's kind of interesting that when I first started doing this about three years ago, I was looking for some material to make this, to make what I do a little bit more poignant. You see, because what happens is we talk about decision making, right? You've all been decision makers and you will, as you ascend the ladder of life, you will become more involved decision makers. You'll make bigger and better decisions as you go forward. But when we teach decision making, it turns out that we leave out the emotional juice and you leave out a lot because as you know from your own experience, people don't make decisions purely based on logic. And often logic, as, we will, as I will share with you, logic can often take a back seat. And so therefore, overly focusing on logic actually can be very counterproductive. So this movie had just come out at that time. And uh, as I was sitting in Karachi, uh, trying to figure out how to make it relevant, I asked the participants, you know, shall we take a chance? Shall we do something that we have not done before, that I have not done before? And we will co-create this. And they were, of course, very, very receptive and very, very open. So this is how this came about. This was a couple of days after Holi in 2013. I still remember, I still had color under my fingernails and so on. Uh, so that is how it started. And it was, shall we say, a super hit. So since then, I have now taken this all over the world. I've done this with all the secretaries to the government of India. I've done it with uh, senior leaders of various kinds. And it's always, and you know, as I do this, there are more and more layers that that become uncovered even for me. So this is what I'm going to sort of share with you. And the reason why uh, I chose Lincoln, is, see, th my thought originally was to use the movie Gandhi to do this kind of analysis. But there were two reasons not to use it. One, the movie is set over a much longer period of time, several decades, right? So it's a little bit harder to contextualize and to analyze it. And secondly, while I'm sure they would have gamely played along if I had insisted, but using Gandhi in Pakistan may have been a little bit of an issue. So that is why we used Lincoln. Now, the great thing about this uh, movie is that it is really about a three-month period which was decisive in the history of the United States and had reverberations throughout the world. So therefore, it is very easy to analyze this. It's very easy to contextualize this. And so it lends itself very well to the kind of analysis that we're going to do today. So without further ado, let me sort of launch into uh, the contextualization. This is a table from the census of the United States of 1860. Now, if you see this, these are the states of the South, the Deep South mostly. And here is the population and the percentage of the population, which is slaves. South Carolina at 57.2%. Can you imagine this? 57%, almost two thirds of the population of South Carolina uh, were slaves. Mississippi, 55%. Uh, Louisiana, 47. Alabama, 45. Florida, 44 almost. Georgia, 43.7. And so on down the line, up to Arkansas and Tennessee, 25. So these were the states, basically, that had slavery. Now, why did, they, why did they have slavery? Again, a very quick introduction to American history. I'm sure all of you have encountered some of this material at some stage in some form, but 
it would be good to sort of recall that. So why, why did they have slavery in the first place? By the way, they didn't have slavery in the North, mostly. How come? Anybody? Yes. Their economy was agriculturally based, so they needed people to work on the plantations. Exactly. What kind of plantations? Which plantations? Cotton. And tobacco. Tobacco. Yes, thank you. So the South is warmer, hum more humid, uh, more convenient for uh, cotton and tobacco. And those are very labor intensive, require dexterity, manual labor almost. So children were also required. So all of this basically led to the institution of slavery, among other things. Which is also the reason why, because the North was more industrialized, less agricultural, less rural, so therefore they didn't have slavery. These, I mean, it's a complicated question, but by and large, this is a one minute summary of why that was the case. Now, obviously, this was the founding sin, the original sin of the United States, that there was slavery in the original constitution of the United States. So obviously it did not sit well with a lot of people and there was a lot of debate, a lot of movement to try and abolish slavery, to get rid of the original sin as it were. And so there was a debate that was going on in the middle of the 19th century and one of the people who was very prominent was Abraham Lincoln who at that point was a relatively unknown lawyer. He was a very good storyteller as I'm sure you've seen in the movie. He was an unknown lawyer who was practicing in Illinois, in Springfield, Illinois, actually. And he was going around the country giving talks against slavery. And I believe it was in 1859, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, some of my American colleagues here may be able to correct me if I've uh, made a slight error. Uh, but in 1859, they had the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates in New York. And the newly formed New York Times covered it and Lincoln, and remember newspapers were the social media of that time. The telegraph had just been invented. So news could travel. So he became an overnight hero. Now at the same time, the Republican Party was having its convention to elect its presidential candidate. And on the other side, the Democrats also were doing that. Now what is interesting is that at that time, which was the conservative party and which was the liberal party amongst the Democrats and the Republicans? Can anybody indicate? Yes? The conservative party was the Democrats and the, lib and the liberal party was the Republicans in which Lincoln was. And by the way, the multi-party system had only recently gotten off the ground in the United States. And so the parties were forming and reforming. And it's what, is, what is interesting is that it's an eerie echo of the present that you will see here. That is to say, there was a party called the Know Nothing Party in the United States, which ultimately got dissolved and got, parts of it got absorbed in the then Democratic Party, which was very conservative. And they had a stance which was anti-immigration. They had a stance which was xenophobic. They had a stance which was anti-trade. It was very mercantilist. And furthermore, if you ask them anything, they would deny everything and they'd say, we know nothing. So they came to be popularly called the Know Nothing Party. And then there were the Whigs. The Whig Party in Europe, uh, in Britain in particular, and in the United States, were people who were more for progress, like Bernie Sanders. So it's, it's hilarious, and what is interesting, I'll show you a map of the United States with uh, the political affiliations of 150 years ago. It's absolutely eerie, <laughs> you know, what you will see. The names may have changed, the labels may have changed, but the reality is not that different today as it was, as compared to what it was then, okay? So be that as it may, then this convention, uh, the Republican convention happens, and it is deadlocked because there are three candidates and they cannot decide on one. You can't do a simple majority if you have three candidates who are roughly equally powerful and it was deadlocked. And because of his prominence, Abraham Lincoln was chosen as a compromise candidate. So he was helicoptered in from an unknown 
lawyer a couple of years prior to that, to somebody who made his name on the social media of that time, namely newspapers, to becoming the Republican candidate, it was almost as if he had been plucked from obscurity and planted there. But, but the story gets even more interesting. Because obviously, you can imagine the people that he sort of brushed aside or cast aside, or the people who were cast aside, he certainly didn't do it, were not very happy about that process. But the long and the short of it is that he won the election in 1860. And as a result, the people in the Deep South, in particular these states, became very, very concerned that he was going to abolish slavery because that is what he said he would do. Right? That was part of his platform. So they became very, very upset. And as a result, as a result, they chose to secede from the United States, almost in this order, in, almost in this order, because obviously they had to go through their own process of getting the ratification from their state legislatures. But almost in this process, they seceded. And they came up until Tennessee, number 11. And this is where the process was when the movie starts. Now, what is interesting, this is extremely important to understand the movie and the decision-making context and everything else, is that the bottom four states, Kentucky with 19.5 slaves, Maryland with 12.7% slaves, Missouri with 9.7% slaves, Delaware with 1.5% slaves, are states which have legal slavery, but they're still part of the union. They have not seceded yet. Remember, they're too far down. They're mostly industrialized, mostly more urbanized than the deep south states. So they choose not to secede. But, and this is the crux, as you know, Lincoln wants to amend the Constitution, the 13th Amendment, so-called, to abolish slavery. Now, the United States Constitution is famously hard to change, to amend. You require what? Can somebody tell me very quickly what do you require to amend the US Constitution? Do you want to share? A uh, two-third majority in the House of Representatives. As that's what I know from the movie last night. Okay, what else? That's one part. There are two others. Yes? Um, two-thirds majority in the Senate and three-fourths ratification by the states. Yes. So triple, right? Two-thirds in, two in, the, in the House, two-thirds in the Senate, and three-fourths of the states. Now, remember, there aren't 50 states at that time. I think there are more like slightly fewer than, what, 30, something like that. But the point is that these four states, they are part of the union. If they flip and go on the other side, what happens? What happens? What happens to any chance of ratifying the amendment? It would be lost, right? Because if you need these states to be on your side, then the decision-making problem becomes very different. So I'll, I'll share that with you in a minute. But please understand that if you need three quarters of the state to ratify the amendment to the Constitution, then if four states go from one side to the other, essentially the game is over. It's never going to be ratified. So Lincoln had to tread very carefully because he had to take care of these four states, which, what in economic terms are called the marginal states, the states who are at the margin. And as you know, those of you who've been trained in economics know that all of economics happens at the margin. It's the margin which determines what happens to the system. So these four states were extremely powerful in, from that point of view. And Lincoln is supposed to have said something very interesting. He said, it would be nice to have God on my side but I must have Kentucky. So Kentucky was, and by the way, it's very interesting. Lincoln, his wife was a very, uh, was, a, was, a, was a woman of faith. But Lincoln, it's very ironic, he was an agnostic. And you get sense, a sense of that in the movie also, right? But he was an agnostic. So it is kind of interesting that he made that statement. It is very much in consonance with 
what he was trying to do. Okay. So, this is what the United States looked at that time, looked like at that time. First of all, the green states, or rather green areas of the map, uh, were not states at that time because they were very sparsely populated, uh, and uh, they had not been they had not been given statehood. They were just territories, so they didn't really count. That included Alaska, that included Hawaii, and all the Midwestern and uh, I mean the uh, the the mountain states and Washington state and others. So ignore those for the moment. The blue states are the ones where there is no slavery. Never was, never was going to be. The, the gray states are the ones where there was slavery and they seceded. These are the ones from the deep south that I just talked about. And the four, and then there is very interesting, uh, a very interesting state which is the, the, the red one, Virginia and West Virginia. So essentially Virginia secedes from the Union and then West Virginia secedes from Virginia to become part of the Union again. So West Virginia basically comes back into the blue territory from the, from the gray territory. And the other four, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, are the ones which are the border states which have slavery and which are still in the Union. Now this is extremely important to understand if you're going to understand how Lincoln was trying to influence the nation and how he was trying to make his decision, okay? Any questions on this? Okay. Now, how faithful is this movie? On the left, you have the real Abraham Lincoln, and on the right, you have Daniel Day-Lewis. It's almost as if Abraham Lincoln has been reincarnated. Now, the great thing about this movie is that it is so accurate. There are a couple of inaccuracies, and I can tell you those right up front. One is that for dramatic effect, they show African Americans coming into the house for the vote. That didn't happen. They were not allowed to come into the chamber, so that was for dramatic effect. And apparently, they got the order of the roll call wrong. But apart from that, almost everything in the movie is based on actual written record. The words that people speak are mostly taken from the written record. Uh, furthermore, the period has been reconstructed very lovingly. The accents are very accurate. I could recognize the Kentucky accent. I could recognize the Indiana accent. I could recognize the accents from New York. So all of those are very, and all of those are very faithfully produced. The ticking of clocks have been re reproduced very faithfully. And the most interesting part is that they got the characters to look like what they actually looked like earlier, including Abraham Lincoln. Look at this. Then look at Mary Lincoln, how closely Sally Fields resembles the real Mary Lincoln. Robert Lincoln, see how close the resemblance is. Tad Lincoln, look at that. Now, John Hay and Nicolay, Hay and Nicolay were the two assistants that Lincoln had. They always hovered around him in the movie. And they were like his men Friday. Fridays, as it were. They always, they were by his side day and night. They almost lived in the White House. Now what is interesting is that when Lincoln passed away, he, they, he and Nicolay wrote, they, they collected everything that they could rec recollect and wrote an eight volume biography of Lincoln, which since copyright has expired, you can sort of download from the web, I have it, highly recommended if you want to sort of dive a little bit deeper and analyze this. So that is John Hay. This is Nicolay. And see again how close the resemblance is. Elizabeth Keckley, uh, William Slade. Look at that, Henry Seward and David Stratham. I mean, it's almost as if you have an identical twin here. And by the way, this individual, Henry Seward, first of all, what was the position that he had in Lincoln's cabinet? Hmm? Secretary of State, in effect the Foreign Secretary. So what is interesting that is that he was one of the three rivals that Lincoln had in the Republican Party for the presidential nomination. Remember I said that there were three candidates 
And I believe the second one, uh, and essentially what happened is, so why did Lincoln get him in the cabinet? Remember, these people were very upset with Lincoln. And right up until the end held a grudge against him. That their place, which was rightfully theirs, was snatched away by an upstart. So why did Lincoln get Henry Seward or William Henry Seward into his cabinet? Yes. Because uh, they were as qualified as him to make decisions, proper decisions, because they were his competitors. So why would you put your competitors in the same room as you? Because um, if people have chosen me to become their leader and I have them as my competitors, that means that they have the niche in them as well okay. to excel as I excel. Okay. Very interesting. So why, why did he need people to excel as he did? Yes. Because he has a different opinion about things. Yeah. So uh, as a leader, we should consider all the opinion which is different. So that's why he has considered. And why at this particular juncture does he want to do that? Uh, that I have to think. Okay. Why does he want to do that at this particular juncture? Let me come from the other side. Why does he want to do this at this particular juncture? Yes. Although they were competitors, but they have a common interest and a common goal to, uh, you know, go uh, eradicate the slavery. So why does he want these people in the cabinet? Because they do have that same skill, same enthu to uh, achieve that thing. Okay. So that's why they invited. Yes. So I think that is absolutely accurate. Other comments? Yes. I would assume he was a lawyer and he wanted someone with a political mindset and a good... Uh, good question. I don't know whether they were lawyers or not, but that's something for you to find out. Would you look it up and let me know? Perfect. Yes. Why would why would you want them in his case? Um, particularly in the case of William Henry Seward, uh, it was well known that the South was close to the British Empire. Right. And uh, in terms of foreign relations, this yes. man was uh, the most accomplished person, the most well-known American outside America. Yes. So it was crucial uh, to have him as Secretary of State in order to manage relations outside America because Will Lincoln wasn't well-known in the international sphere. Fair enough. Very good. Was. Very good. Are you a history major? Oh, no, I've read Team of Rivals. Perfect. So. Excellent. Good, good, good. Being in need of support, you autom automatically align with your competitors because the people who who side with them also become um, aligned to your cause. But why at this particular time does he want it in? Um, maybe because it's just too close to the, I mean, when he wants to pass the 13th Amendment, the, the numbers are so close that every sort of every number adds. That is true. And I think the point that I'm getting at is that this is an extraordinary time in American history. He needs all the support that he can get. And therefore, even if it means that it is more difficult for him personally to manage people who were his direct rivals. He said, the United States and our ideals require that. And hence, he put in the rivals. And Doris Kern Goodwin's book that he was referring to, called The Team of Rivals, takes its name. It is an eponymous tract. It takes its name from the fact that Abraham Lincoln put his rivals in the cabinet. Now, President Obama, when he was elected during the transition time, he read this book. And it led him to, to make one of the most interesting appointments of his uh, career, which was what? Yes. Hillary Clinton, sorry, as a... Uh, uh, In which position? Uh, Secretary of uh, like Foreign Affairs. Secretary of State. Yes, exactly the same position. So. He did it for almost the same reasons, right? I need the best people in, and you need a big heart, right? You need somebody who's psychologically very secure. You need somebody who can handle conflict. Inside the tent rather than having him outside it? Yes. So there, as the, yeah, uh, do you know what I'm saying is? I'd rather have him inside the tent throwing garbage out right, rather than outside the tent, throwing garbage in. There's a more colorful version that I will not repeat, but, <laughs> but, that's, but that was the motivation. Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War, like, again, see how close the resemblance. I mean, it's just eerie. 
the only person who doesn't faithfully look like his real uh, or like the original self is Preston Blair and thankfully so. <laughs> now, Thaddeus Stevens, again see how close the resemblance is, Tommy Lee Jones is one of the real discoveries of this movie. You see, what had happened is that uh, in the movie, as you know, he had a crucial role, and in the passage of the 13th Amendment also, he had a crucial role. But how would you characterize his opinions vis-a-vis -vis the dominant opinions in the United States at that time? How would you characterize it? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, he was more liberal in his ideas, but he... More he, liberal? Yeah, because he, wanted, he actually believed in... Uh, full equality, whereas yes. he had to control himself in, in front of other people so that they pass the bill for the greater good. So would you say that he was close to the center or close to the fringe? As in? Close to the center of the public opinion in the United States at that time or close to the fringe? Uh, he was a little more radical as per, the, as per the people. Little more, would you say he was just a little more radical or a lot more radical? lot more radical, right? And we will see that in a minute. But this is the irony, right? If you're too far ahead of your times, people will forget you. If you're too far ahead of your times, people will forget you. And he indeed was forgotten in the United States. There was just a college in Pennsylvania, Stevens College, that was named after him. But other than that, his memory had not been kept alive. This movie basically recreates the persona of Thaddeus Stevens. Very interesting man, also a lawyer. And his entire life was spent in atoning for a sin that he committed uh, that, that sort of bothered him. See, he was a struggling lawyer. And the first brief that he took, because he needed the money, was of a slave owner in the South whose slave had run away to the North to gain his freedom. And he, and the slave was captured, and due to the intervention of Thaddeus Stevens in his early 20s, was restored to the master. And this guilt never left him, that he said, oh my God, what have I done? I have been instrumental in enslaving or helping enslave an individual. So that guilt never left him. And in some sense, the entire arc of his development politically was as if that he wanted to atone for his sins. And hence the radicalism, hence the scene, the extraordinary scene, which by the way was absolutely accurate. He had married his African-American housekeeper. An extraordinary event at that time, especially for an elected person especially for an elected person. An extraordinary event. In the movie, it was yes. not clear whether everybody knew about that. I mean, whether it was an open yes, it was, relationship yeah. or not. In fact, it, she mentions that it is an open secret. It is an open secret, but I will not let you take your housekeeper to the house. Even though everybody knows about it, we don't want to make, get in their faces with it. It's still a sensitive issue. And by the way, there were states in the South which had intermarriage, anti-intermarriage laws right up until the 1970s, let's not forget. Right up until the 1970s, there were states where it was illegal for people to cross the color line in terms of marriage. So remember, I mean, we tend to forget a lot of these things, but uh, so Stevens, Thaddeus Stevens, basically, again, very, 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 very accurate. So the analysis. Now, by the way, the more, whenever, whatever, whatever decision-making you engage in, whatever is the decision-making that you engage in, if it is complex enough, it is complex not because it is technologically complex, it is complex. Remember, decisions which are technologically complex are very easy to make. How do I, how do I balance my portfolio? How do I assign machines to different tasks? How do I configure a supply chain? How do I manage the air traffic control system? 
these are very complex problems, but they are relatively easy because the complexity can be handled mathematically and you're done with it. On the other hand, the so-called adaptive problems, which are complex because of the human decision-making involved, because of the fact that you have to, different people have different views on that problem, those problems are the really quote-unquote wicked problems or hard problems. Because the same glass is viewed as half full by some individuals and as half empty by others. The same thing is framed very differently. Or in fact, it may be perceived as very different. It may be framed as, very, as something different. So therefore, therefore, these problems are hard. But what is interesting is that the higher you go in life, the higher you go in an organization, the more responsibility that you have. In fact, the word responsibility itself connotes the fact that you have to deal with people. Nobody says that you have more responsibility because you deal with more machines. You have more responsibility if you deal with more complex issues and with more people. So therefore, having, you have to understand how do the views line up? If the, same people, if the same glass is being viewed differently, if the same 13th Amendment is being viewed differently by different people, you have to do an analysis to figure out how do the views line up. And the views, the way in which the views line up is what is called the analysis of stakeholders. And the stakeholders are the different factions. Each faction has a particular common view of looking at the world. A faction is united by a common worldview. Is that clear? So these were the factions that Lincoln had to deal with in passing the 13th Amendment. Who can tell me what these factions represented? Anybody? Radical Republicans? What were they? Give me an example and tell me what they wanted. They wanted absolute abolition of slavery. Yes. An example was? Um, I don't know. Can you speak? Exactly. Yes. Thank you. The moderate conservative Republicans, who was the exemplar, what did they want? Anyone? Secretary of State was sort of like that, yes. Who else? Who was the prototypical example of a, uh, of a moderate or a conservative Republican? Yes. Preston Blair. Preston Blair. Preston Blair. And what was his view? If you can describe his point of view, what did he want? How would you describe his point of view? They weren't, they were, um, I'm not sure if I'm completely correct, they weren't complete abolitionists, but yes. they were uh, in principle against slavery. Yes. But they wanted a more measured approach towards its eradication. Very, very, very well put. See, people differed not only in their ideals, but also in the speed with which they want to realize them. So people get differentiated based on how fast they want to move in a particular direction. Okay? So, Moderate Republicans wanted slavery abolished, but they wanted to keep the union together first. They didn't want to do it at the cost of the union. And they said, fine, let's wait 60 years, 100 years if necessary. Let's do it slowly. War Democrats were, in the Democratic Party, people who were like the radical Republicans. Remember, there were some Democrats who were elected even in the free states, which did not have slavery. So they mimicked the opinions of their constituents, and so therefore they were in favor of abolition of slavery. Peace Democrats were like moderate conservative Republicans. There were slight variations, but that was what it was. And then the border states. Now what is interesting is that the border states are in the Union, as I mentioned, but they also have slavery. And Lincoln cannot push them too hard. And in particular, if he pushes too hard so that they tip over on the other side, the whole, the whole thing is sunk. And then he has to manage the public opinion on different sides. And what is interesting, and this is what the movie does beautifully, he also has to manage his family. Again, most of you are too young to, to have spouses and children. And most of you are only now beginning or will begin to ascend the job ladder. 
as it were. But I can assure you that when you are approaching the top, the closer you get to it, the bigger the dilemma will be. It is sometimes put in this neutral term, the work-life balance, right? How do you balance your work and how do you balance your life? And it's very interesting that Balzac famously said that you can have excitement either in your life or in your work, but not both. Why? If you are dealing with turmoil, if there's too much excitement in your life, if you are like some of the individuals who have too much fun in their private lives, then it can be detrimental to your business success. For example, uh, if you look at Steve Jobs, he did his best work when he settled into sort of very routine domesticity with Laureen Powell Jobs and his three kids. Prior to that, when he had a tumultuous home life, his work life suffered. Bill Gates has had a very regulated, very disciplined, very boring even from the outside personal life, but that is the source of his strength. If there's turmoil at home, it will affect your ability to do great things because some of your energy is out there managing the turmoil at home. And unfortunately, Lincoln had challenges on that issue, which we saw very clearly in the movie. All right. So now here is the crux of the decision-making problem. Yes, ma'am. This is something about work-life uh, uh, work balance that I'm talking about. Okay, it's, it's possible to have excitement uh, all, of, all around in your life, provided there's no dichotomy. Your professional life and uh, your family life has to be in coherence with each other. Because energy is only one. If you divide it into positive and negative, you nullify it. And if you direct it towards positivity, that can be a lot of fun which, uh, which surrounds your life. Yes, but I mean, uh, I mean uh, yes. But remember, even your ability to have positive fun is limited. And you have to decide where you're going to have it. So, and by the way, uh, I don't want to name names. One of the famous individuals that all Indians would recognize, you know, the old joke, what is the quickest way to become a millionaire? Start with a billion and buy an airline. And you know whom I'm referring to. If you have too much fun, if you have too much fun and, you know, the business becomes your toy uh, and you use that as a way to have too much fun in your private life, you're going to have a big problem in your professional life, okay? So the point is, the point is, this is the crux of the decision-making problem and I just want to set it up in the next half an hour for you. This is what the movie comes down to and this is what you as leaders will have to do and then I will tell you how you move in that direction. What are the tactics that you use? Okay? First, how do you frame decisions? And then, how do you frame the tactics that you will use? So first of all, these are the range of views. What does break up the union? So can somebody walk me through it? Who wants to start at the top and tell me what those views are? Anyone? Break up the union, hold the union together, equality under the law, political equality, social econ equality, economic equality. Why are these, can somebody walk me through it? Anyone? What is break up the union? What does that mean? Break up the union. Which is what in effect had already happened. So let it be. What does that mean? Anyone? So break up the union is basically saying it has happened, we are too far apart, let's leave it at that. So it is to accept the status quo. What is hold the union together but not have equality under the law? What is that? It is what is called status quo ante. That is, restore the status quo that existed before 1860. That is, 
bring the southern states back in, but say, we are not going to abolish slavery, but you stay together. Then comes equality under the law. What does equality under the law mean? What does equality under the law mean? That in the eyes of law, everybody will be seen equal. So for, give me an example. Uh, so the treatment uh, for... Uh, so if you and I commit a murder, and you're white and I'm black, how would right. that work? So uh, ju the judicial system should treat both of us as, e see both of us as equal, and there shouldn't be any uh, bias. Perfect. So that is equality under the law. That is equal treatment for equal acts. Pretty straightforward. What is political equality? Political equality? Mm -hmm. um, it is when uh, politicians of different well, races should be given the same rights and the same opportunities. Uh, yes. In particular, what else? Not just politicians, but is it only for politicians and people who are running for office? Who else should have that kind of right? Um, yes? Um, as well as allowing all citizens to vote and exactly. allowing African Americans. Allowing all citizens to vote, right? So that is political equality. What is social equality, on the other hand? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Sorry? Equality of status and opportunity. Wait, opportunity is coming next. But what does equality of status mean? Sorry. What does equality of status mean? Uh, preventing any uh, exploitation or discrimination on the basis of uh, race, color, gender. Uh, For example, give me an example. What would discrimination look like? Yes, if you go to a rest... Yes. The black is served differently, the white is served differently. Correct. Even now, Colin Paul talks about it even after he became a uh, lieutenant in the army. Yes. He was still, still served differently in the early 70s. Yes. Right up until the 70s, there was, there, there was de facto discrimination. And the whole civil rights movement was against that. So social equality, by the way, Political equality is the vote, so, uh, so, so universal franchise came shortly thereafter, after the 13th Amendment, but social equality did not come until very late. That was what the social civil rights movement was all about. What was the social equality question on which, as it were, the, so the civil rights movement was triggered? What was the trigger? What was the social equality event that triggered, so to speak, the civil rights movement? Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure if this is correct, and I don't think it's an event, but the fact that the uh, black soldiers were paid um, less. No, 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 remember, that's much earlier. Now we're talking about the 1960s. So, yes. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, absolutely. Rosa Parks, right? So the, what was the social equality event? The fact that, could you sit in the front of the bus, or did, would you, were you required to sit in the back of the bus? That is social equality, right? If, all, if you and I can sit next to each other, we have social equality. If we can't, then we don't. And uh, the caste system, where there was distinctions like this, therefore, man you know, therefore mandated uh, discrimination. So there was no social equality, therefore. Yes, ma'am. Social equality, I think, will also, uh, should also cover that factor that whether a person is earning, uh, is having a lower income. Economic equality. That is economic. But uh, that will come, I think, both under, uh, under social as well as the economic equality. It could have aspects, but then yeah. if it's purely an economic thing, and economic equality, which means equal pay for equal work, many would argue that nowhere except for Scandinavian countries, this does not, that men and women are paid differently for the same work. Again, there are arguments on both sides, but the data seems to support a little bit of that. That there are differences across race also. Uh, when it comes to wages. So, so there is economic equality, we are still not there. Uh, certainly not in India, uh, and uh, in many parts of the world as well. So what is interesting is that he had these six views. And who was advocating economic equality amongst, his, amongst the people that he met, amongst Lincoln, Lincoln's uh, friends or collaborators or co-conspirators, who ag argued for economic equality? Thaddeus Stevens. If you remember the conversation that they have in the basement of the White House, he suggests 
that the plantations should be turned over to the, to the African Americans, to the blacks, and that they should be armed, something that nobody would contemplate even today, right? Radical provision for economic equality. On the other hand, break up the union, that is what the Southern Confederates wanted. Preston Blair and the moderate Republicans and the Peace Democrats said, hold the union together, but let's keep it at that. Let's just go to status quo ante. Equality under the law was being advocated by Seward, not initially. Initially, he was for status quo ante. And then uh, Lincoln also decides to draw the line here. Why does he draw the line here at equality under the law, but not political equality? Why does he draw the line there? And certainly not social and economic equality. See, remember, a decision maker has to make a choice. Too little, and the decision is almost not worth making. Too much, and the decision will not go through. So you will fail on both sides. And you have to identify just where to draw the line, which is radical enough to be meaningful, but not radical enough to be doable. So he had to draw the line here under equality, under the law, and furthermore, also get his constituents who wanted this, or his collaborators who wanted this, like Thaddeus Stevens and others, to also go in. That famous scene on the floor of the house when he talks, when Thaddeus Stevens talk, talks about the mephitic fumes of oratory, that is when he changes what he thinks is achievable. And he also draws the line there, and I'm sorry. He also draws the line there, and that is critical. So before we get to an analysis of uh, the, the techniques of persuasion, why the urgency? Why was there the urgency? If the American war would end, and what would happen if that happened? Those who were uh, free would again become slaves. Like. Uh, well, remember, the, 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 those who, for whom it was made were still in the South. And the amendment had not yet been passed. So the question is, why the urgency for the war? By the way, let me show a clip from the movie, which may sort of refresh your memory a little bit. Do you remember the scene? I'm just, the sound is probably not going to come on, but do you remember the scene? Does the, this is the scene where Seward comes to realize something about why Lincoln wants urgency. Do you remember why, what the scene was all about? Yes. Because the popular belief was the war, that the war was being fought over slavery and this amendment was considered as a military necessity during the course of war. So if the war ended before the amendment was passed, then the people thought there was no need to pass the amendment considering the war had already been won. Correct. So there were a lot of people who had come to believe that the war was a method of ending slavery. And if the war ended, then that method would no longer be available. And they only were for the abolition of slavery because it would end the war. And that's what the scene was all about. So the urgency was because, and remember, the movie makes it very clear that in the new house that was coming in, they had a two-thirds, the Republicans had a two-thirds majority anyway. So his wife was basically saying, why don't you wait until that time? But if he had waited, it would not have worked. Why? Because by that time, the war would have ended. And even with a two-thirds majority, the Republicans in his own party would have said, let's wait for a different time. So the urgency was because, the urgency was because the war was about to end. Fascinating, fascinating uh, set of circumstances, isn't it? There are nine ways in which you can persuade people. And remember, the higher you go, the less you do and less more you get done. Until at the top, you almost do nothing by yourself, but you get almost everything done. If, especially in a large organization, if you're running a country, heavens, you can't do the work of 1.3 billion people, if you're in India or in China. 
if you're the CEO of a large corporation, if you head a university, if you head whatever organization, you have to get work done through others. Therefore, you have to persuade them to do things that they may not otherwise want to do. And so there are only these nine techniques which are available. The first is inspiration, where you appeal to somebody's values and ideals. The second is consultation, where you say, you seek somebody's opinion as a way to build support. The third is a personal appeal, do it for me. The fourth is, I give you something, you give me something, we do an exchange. The fifth is ingratiation, or flattery, or praise. Rational persuasion is when you use logic, or reasoned arguments. Legitimating tactics, when you throw the rule book at somebody, you say, this is written in the book, do it. Coalition tactics, do it because others are doing it, and pressure, pressure is not just, break, I'll break your head if you don't do it, that's pressure in its extreme form, but also demands, threats, frequent checking, or persistent reminders. That is also, those are also forms of pressure. So there are these nine techniques, and by the way, these are not new. Those of you who've read Chanakya Niti know the four Sanskrit words that are used, sam, dam, danda, bhed, right? This is just a ninefold elaboration of something that has been known for thousands of years. What is new is the research that I'm going to share with you in just the next slide. But any questions about this? Is this pretty clear? And by the way, this is crucial in the work that you're going to be doing as part of this fellowship, as part of this leaders forum, because you're going to be influencers. You're here because we are training you to be influencers. We are training you to be leaders. We are training you to be tacticians and strategists who will formulate, as Lincoln says, the ideal of the true north, but you will also figure out how to avoid the swamps and the deserts and the pitfalls along the way. And you do that by essentially having a very clear sense of direction and then also figuring out how you're going to do it. And there are only nine ways. Any questions on this before I show you the final slide that I want to Can share with you? Can you explain the last one? Uh, yeah. uh, Pressure? A coalition tactic, actually. A coalition tactic, yes. Yeah. So coalition tactic saying, you know, do it because this group of people is doing it. It's monkey see, monkey do. In effect saying, your friends are doing it, why don't you do it too? Right? This is essentially coalition tactics. Anything else that needs to be clarified? Well, motivation would, uh, you can motivate in many different ways. Inspiration, by the way. By the way, I've heard that you're from the army, sir. Uh, we have uh, a general here. Um, in the Indian army, I'm told they use four words, right? Janda, danda, fanda, and anda. So, janda is ideals. Danda is pressure. Fanda is fundamentals as in logic. And anda is exchange. <laughs> Right? So, so it's another version of Sam Dam but, uh, but, but the army, by the way, the symbols of the army, the flag, the uniform, the, uh, the symbols, the traditions, they're there to inspire you. Right? So that is inspiration. You can do consultation, personal appeals, all of these basically would work. And so this is the crux of what I want to share with you. The sum of each row adds up to what does, so essentially this is the research on these nine techniques, okay? Inspi now, commitment means I do it, I do it willingly, I will do it even when you're not looking. If I'm committed to something, I will do it even when you're not looking. I will do it because I want to do it. Compliance is I will do it, but only when you're looking. When I'm left on to my own devices, I will not do it. I comply with the order, but I'm not really happy with it. And resistance means, do what you want, I'm not going to do it. So what this research indicates, and this is the summary of a lot of research, basically, 
uh, it says basically that inspiration meets no resistance. If you are appealing to somebody's ideals and values, you have them. You're not going to meet any resistance. If you consult with them, that's also pretty good, but it still meets with a resistance 18% of the time. How come? Why do people resist when you consult them? When you consult them, why do people resist? They also have a belief. And by the way, when you consult people, you also run the risk that you ask them to take a view that they may not have had before. So I may, be, you know, I may not have thought of it, but when I think about it and you consult me, or when you consult me and I think about it, I may find that I'm actually opposed to you. So consultation, by and large, works well, but it can sometimes backfire. Personal appeal. I appeal to you. Most of the time, that also works well, but sometimes it fails. Why? Because, because of what? Why does personal appeal sometimes fail? the person you're trying to appeal to, even if like they're your friend or out of loyalty, have a radically different opinion to the one you do. So they may take, choose to like, on the grounds of principle, choose to stick to their stance rather than go with yours. Exactly. And also, your asking on the basis, do it for me, may actually make them uncomfortable. Do you see that? So personal appeal can also be negative. Exchange also fails a quarter of the time. And by the way, I'll share with you something that I stumbled upon. Uh, about this a little later towards the end. Um, exchange fails a quarter of the time. Why? Why does exchange fail a quarter of the time? What may it trigger? Yes. You could always want more or... You could want more, but there's a fundamental reason why you may be... Yes? Something similar is that people think that what they are offering is more valuable than what the that other person could be. Uh, that is, you may have a difference of value. But what else? There's a more fundamental reason. Yes. Insecurity might be there. So. Um, generally, people uh, um, have a more, uh, they have this form of distrust within someone who they are trying to exchange with. Okay. Because. Distrust. There could be distrust. Yes. What else? There's a more fundamental reason, though. Yes, ma'am. They don't want what you have to offer. Yeah, that may be, but there's a more fundamental reason. What could be a more fun? Yes. Um, the fact that you're asking them to give something of theirs in exchange of something that you're giving yes. them. Yeah, but there's a more fundamental reason. I think an exchange would be almost like buying something. So exactly. the person himself has no belief in it. Yes. So, so what, what may that trigger? Uh, I mean, the person that doesn't believe in what they're exchanging, so for, you know, that so could you're be one, But there could be a deeper reason than that. That person may believe that, but still may have an objection. Why? Um, because he's having to, you know, pay for it. In a sense, exchange is almost like a barter, like, a, you know, I'm paying for something, and it's something that, uh, you know, if the, uh, the other person doesn't value what he's giving to me. Okay. So, you know, in that sense. Yes, but there's an even, you, you, you've gotten that shade very, very nicely. But there's a deeper reason. Uh, the other person may think that you may you are asking something unreasonable uh, and pressurizing him to do make him do something unreasonable, which may not be right later. Yes. So, yes, unreasonable and therefore may not be right. Yes, ma'am. Maybe it's like adding material value to your decision. So it could be. Yes. It could be that. But more fundamentally. If he needs to give you something in return to do it, the point might not be strong enough for me to do it on my okay. own. Okay. Yeah, th that, is, that is the point. That exchange means that it is not strong enough to do it on your own. That is the point. But, okay, so the ultimate, yes ma'am. So what may be the ultimate reason why you may refuse? Maybe the f person might simply be offended or might not, his values are just too strong to exactly. trade. Exactly. Remember, who do you think I am? Am I for sale? Who do you think I am? Am I for sale? That you can dangle a carrot in front of me and I will bite? So you have to be very careful with regard to exchange. Ingratiation, again, it fails about 40% of the time. Why? Because it makes people uncomfortable, right? 
So suppose I come up to you and say, that will make lots of people very uncomfortable. So ingratiation also will fail part of the time. Now, this is very, very interesting, rational persuasion. It fails half the time. Why? This for me, I must tell you, I'm an economist. I teach decision making, you know, my taught game theory, all that kind of stuff. This to me, this one line was a revelation. And it has fundamentally altered how I behave. Why does logic, reason, rational persuasion fail half the time? Half the time, it fails. By the way, we, you know, I'm an academic. I love reason. I love to argue. Yes? Um, at least from where, as an educationist, when you're dealing with young people, uh, logic, I think, fails half the time because we are emotional beings. We are emotional yeah. beings, Human yes. beings have, um, are, are fairly emotional, and especially with younger people. I think plain logic sometimes may not be. You have to study the situation and deal with how you approach them situationally. Right. So it's not plain logic since we are also emotional, cultural beings. Very good point. But there's a deeper point also. What, is, what else may be the issue with regard to uh, logic? One is the fact that it says persuasion, means you're having to persuade. Obviously, the other person doesn't have a belief in what you're trying right. to. And rational, I think, to me, it's rational, but may not be the same logic to the other person. To the other, you know, the other person's point of view may not be the same. So, what is rational to me may not be rational to somebody else. And but the persuasion me, is, I think, the key because the fact that you're having to persuade means the person is not in sync with your good. belief. Very good. But but what about the fa what about the situation where you and I are having an argument, and I realize that you're actually right. And yet, I don't want to do it. Why? Why would that be the case? And let us say that there are no emotion, ego, ego, absolutely. You see, you see, the thing about logic is that for somebody to win, somebody must lose. By the way, my wife is a very logical person, right? She's a programmer. You know, she knows everything about structured reasonings, structured arguments, and everything. Yet the big learning that I had in our marriage, you know, we've now been married 25 years, is I do not argue with her. I do not argue with her. The first three are the ways to persuade her. My dear, you're the best. Janu, kya sochte hain iske baare mein? You know, that's, that's what I do. It's an absolute, you see, my earlier, I remember, you know, my earlier instinct in the early days of our marriage used to be, come on, let's roll up our sleeves and let's have a really good argument. And that always ended in tears, right? That always ended in tears. And after seeing this, I suddenly realized, you know, so over the years, I'm, I mean, I'm a little slow, but I'm not totally stupid. So over the years, I learned. And then when I saw this research, I, it suddenly hit me. It suddenly hit me that logic is something that you do not use very often, and you use very, very carefully. In the Indian tradition, by the way, uh, it's a pity that rhetoric is not taught anymore. Uh, there are, so in, in the Greek tradition, which we analyzed for a course uh, recently, there are about 63 tropes that are used. You know, there are 63 different techniques that are used. In the Sanskrit literature, we tried to count, we lost count beyond, after 150. There, I mean, there are different there are different ways in which you can, in which you can influence. By the way, and they have beautiful names. These are, they, and they are all nuances of these, these ways of persuading. Over 150 we found, and it's never really been properly compiled. But at the end of the day, there are, they fall in three categories. There are three broad ways of arguing. In Sanskrit, they are called vad, vivad, and vitand. Vad is when you are with friends, you're genuinely trying to advance the cause and there is no ego involved. That is vad. Vivad is when you have a debate. When you're on the podium, one person has to win, another person has to lose. Nobody is making progress based on that. And vitand is when you are totally against that view and you want to demolish it, there is no argument. For example, ISIS, or if you're talking about Nazism, I mean, there is no debate. We are not going to debate. We are not going to dignify 
We're not going to dignify the point of view by arguing it, we're just going to demolish it. And each one of these traditions, each one of these techniques, each one of these broad areas requires a different technique of persuasion. Logic and rational persuasion therefore has to be used very, very carefully in the appropriate environment because it draws blood. It's like, yes, they say logic is like a, no, like a knife. Wouldn't slavery also form part of Nazism and that? And wouldn't they, that part also come across because it yes, is something that is what, demo, that that is is what, demolishing? That is what Thaddeus Stevens was planning to do. But remember, demolition is not possible all the time. So you have to, you have to cut your losses and say, what is it that I can achieve? Right? As they say, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So you don't necessarily, that is by the way what uh, Babur did. He lost seven times to, uh, to, to Rana Sangha and came back and won the eighth time. <laughs> so so that, is, that is basically what is, what, is, what is required sometimes. Legitimating, again, rule book, coalition, and pressure. Now, when you look up so when you do your stake so when you do your analysis for your projects when you do an analysis for any kind of big decision that you have to make you have to careful you have to do several things first of all you have to lay out the options which we did right what is the range of options that are available and they're typically in order of difficulty and order of value secondly who are the stakeholders? And then I'll give you a, a, a quick chart which will help you think about stakeholders. And then that is number three. Number four is how are you going to persuade them? Which of these nine techniques you will use? Now when I do a longer version, I actually walk you through. By the way, there are 50 scenes in the Lincoln movie. Every scene, I think with one exception, which is the final scene, you know, where Lincoln is sort of uh, uh, the penultimate scene, not the final scene, but the penultimate scene. Except that there is persuasion that is happening everywhere. Multi sometimes three, four, five techniques are being used in that scene. I would urge you, those of you who have seen the movie once, go and see it. I've seen it now dozens of times because I do this so often. But with every viewing, there are more layers that are visible because it's just a great work of art, this movie. And the amount of information that they have encapsulated in two and a half hours is something that you would have to study for months. You would have to study at least 20 or 30 books, fat books on Lincoln and the passage of the 13th Amendment to get that level of detail. And still you would not get the emotional juice that the movie gives you. Go back and watch it. Go back and look for these nine techniques again. We'll give you a scene by scene analysis, make a tally of what the techniques were in each scene. And you will find that this is very, very powerful. Now, before I set up the stakeholder analysis, let me tell you the final story, which for me was a revelation. And I'm writing a paper about this, which again sort of leads me to believe that rational persuasion should be used very, very sparingly. So remember the four border states? These were also relatively small states. And they were causing a lot of problem to Lincoln because you know, he constantly had to keep an eye on these small states for the bigger picture. It was distracting him. So he came up with this idea. He said, for these four border states, suppose we buy out all the slaves from the slave owners. Wouldn't that fix the problem? And he said, slaves are assets. Let's find out what is the net present value of this asset. Let us give it to the slave owners. Let's buy the slaves. And lo and behold, the problem would go away in these four border states. And then he would be on much stronger ground to pass the 13th Amendment. So he did a calculation. He said, he does this calculation. He arrives at a figure of $400. That a slave in 1865 or 1864 was worth $400 at that time in net present value over the lifetime of the asset. So slaves were being bought and sold for $400, roughly, give or take. So he said, why don't we just pay the slave owners in these four border states? And he calculated that to do it in Delaware would take only, Delaware was a small state and only had 1.8% slaves. 
So he said half a day, the expenditure that we are incurring on the war for half a day would buy all the slaves out in Delaware. And for all the four border states, only the expenditure for six months on the war would be required. So we've been at it now for five years, he said. And we've lost 750,000 people. Remember, the population of the United States in 1860 was 31 million people, exactly a tenth of what it is today. At that time, they lost 750,000 people. It would have been 7.5 million people today if it were proportionate. 700, so one, one person in 40 had been killed. One person in 10 white males of military age was killed in the Civil War. One person in 10. The war was very costly in terms of men and in terms of material. So he said, why don't we just buy these slave, slaves out? So he sends this, so he, he's extremely excited. He prepares a paper on it. He circulates it. The New York Times, and I have that quote from the New York Times from 1864, the best proposal that they had ever seen in public policy. He very confidently sends it to the House of Representatives, and he does not hear back from them. It just falls with a thud. He's very perplexed. So he calls the representatives from these four states to come into the White House. And I saw from his collected papers, I saw uh, a record of the meetings of this, uh, uh, a record of the meeting minutes, I mean the meeting minutes, which again, nobody seems to have looked at uh, for this particular purpose. And it's interesting that they, there was not a single person there who supported this. It was the ultimate rational argument, the ultimate rational argument. And you know what they said? The kinds of things that we just discussed with regard to exchange and with regard to logic. Some said, and remember, they were not even owning up to it. Some would say, why the hurry? It's going to go away anyway. The war is about to end. This is going to go away anyway. Why hurry it up? Some said, exactly what we discussed. Are we for sale? Do you, think you can, do you think you can buy us out with $400 per slave? So all of these things basically came out. And this proposal went nowhere. To an economist like myself, this would seem like the ideal proposal. Something is worth something to you. We want to take it away from you. Let's compensate you and let's be done with it. Simple cost-benefit analysis. Economics 101. Everything has a price. But of course, it doesn't. So that, my friends, is one of the key learnings from this. Now, very quickly, before I show you the, uh, are there, should some of these techniques not be used? Should some techniques, hmm? Legitimize, legitimizing because with a zero percent commitment. Yes, but sometimes you have to lay down the you law. You have to. You have to, but should not. You have to, but should not. Okay. Well, you see, what is interesting? Are there any other any techniques that you would not use? Yes. I think the issue with legitimizing is you're taking the focus off of the actual context of it and you're more focusing on the fringe elements which is telling you that this is the reason you have to do it, not on right. the actual context of it, which is why most people would not, uh, it would not come from their, themselves to do it because you're not focusing on the actual matter itself. Right. No, fair enough. Not, le okay, legitimating. What about other tactics? Are there some others that you would not use? Yes. I think it depends on how you're using it because technically bribery can be seen as exchange, right? You get something, I get something. Yes. So it totally depends on how you're using it, but if you're using it in a certain way, then yes. it should not be used in yes. none of these and all of these. So the moral is that all of these have a place. So when would you use these and when would you use these? By the way, they all fall into groups. You would not typically use inspiration and pressure at the same time because then one will go against the other. Yes? How do you differentiate personal appeals and inspiration? Uh, personal appeal is on the basis of something that you and I share. But values 
are based on something which are more universal. So, when, so in other words, your personal appeal is you're appealing to somebody's friendship. Va uh, inspiration appealing to his values or her values. So basically the long and the short of it is that all of these should be used in the appropriate context. For longer term, these, if you have all the time in the world, you would use these. If you have very little time, you use this. If there's an emergency, you may have to use this. There are only nine. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. And furthermore, they also fall into groups, right? So the closer they are, the more they can be used together. By the way, you don't have to use only one. You can use more than one. So again, you have to be thoughtful about this. This analysis is very good because the research sets it up very nicely. It determines the, the proximity that these have to each other. So you can just group them in this particular fashion and use them in this, in this way. Yes, ma'am. Uh, a couple of interesting things that I noticed was it's really fascinating to see how resistance and commitment are almost opposite of each other. Yes. So where you have high resistance, you have low commitment and the vice versa. Precisely. Uh, secondly, I mean, while people are mentioning that legitimating might not be an interesting form of persuasion, interestingly enough, that is the highest compliance. Yes. Hence, definitely for uh, a country and, you know, lawmakers, I guess, it makes sense to use it because how Sometimes, else would you yes. get people to comply? Yes, that is certainly true. Uh, so I think that is something that you have to, but remember, what you want is the sum of these two. Ideally, these two should be maximized. Yes? In your research, sir, how often does compliance over this a period... This is, is not mine. Um, your understanding, yes. over a period of time, uh, how often does compliance become commutative? Uh, compliance become commitment, we have a... Uh, uh, well, these are separate things. Compliance rarely becomes com com commitment, right? Because... Period of time, maybe you start appreciating that this compliance goes beyond, I become be, more disciplined to it. it How often does it happen? I could make a case the other way as well. Some compliance may actually become resistance. So, I don't know. The short answer is I don't know. Perhaps we should have a separate discussion about that. So, let me then share with you the final template, which is pretty straightforward, and that will help you encapsulate everything. So this is the final slide. It's in two parts. The first three, so you list the stakeholders, right? So you had, in this case, the conservative Democrats, the radical, I mean, the conservative Republicans, the radical Republicans, the, et cetera, et cetera. You have all of those stakeholders, the border states. And do they have an interest in the problem? high or low, capability to do something about it, high or low, and power to do something, uh, power to make it happen, high or low. And then you, the, whether you want, where are they right now? Zero basically indicates where they are right now. That is, they oppose it, or they may allow it, but they may not support it, or they may support it, or they may make it happen. These are four levels of commitment. So zero indicates where you want, where they are. X indicates where you want them to be. Typically where they are or one step to the right or two steps to the right. And then you feed in the nine techniques to figure out how you will move the zeros to the Xs. So when you are doing your implementation plan for the project that you're working on, this will be an extremely powerful tool for you to use. Do you see that? No? Can I clarify something? Sure? So tell me what is unclear. What's H and L? High and low, sorry. So it means that, so if for example, stakeholder one is very, very, is very, very important to you because he or she has a huge interest in the problem, has a huge capability and a huge power with regard to that. So you better have him either neutralized or on your side. Stakeholder two may have low interest, but high capability and high power. She may be somebody that you may have to educate. She may not have an interest in you. So then you have to do some educating first. And get that person from letting it happen to actively supporting you. <coughs> and so on. Yes. Yeah, uh just to put things into perspective, especially yes. since the last slide that you had as well. Yes. Uh, I think one of the 
interesting things over here that seems to be either missing or encapsulated in sure. uh, some of the columns is uh, in most social contexts, uh, you have certain stakeholders who are affected by a certain topic the most, right. but have the, they're not, they don't have too much influence over Correct. anything that can be yeah. done. So I think in that context as well, uh, especially since you had uh, resistance yes. uh, as one of the things that you talked about, it becomes important to understand where and how we want to approach the problem as well because you don't want to target a stakeholder saying we'll empower you when yeah. there is very little that can be done True. from that perspective. Yeah, then you have to engage in a communication plan. So you may have somebody uh, who, uh, who has a high interest these are the disenfranchised individuals, high interest, low capability, and low power. Yeah. So but, even but they are nonetheless your constituents. Yeah. So that, that that I guess is the key difference, right? So when we talk when we talk about them as constituents, yes. how we empower them and yes. how we are engaging with them is drastically different from let's say working with a group that is there, which is a stakeholder with high interest but uh, low capability and low power. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Any final questions? All right, folks. So I think what we will do now is we will break you up into, by the way, you have to work in the groups that you've been assigned to, your project groups. And now we will just uh, do this exercise where you will work on your problem and you will take this page, you'll write down the stakeholders, you'll, you'll indicate high or low on each of these problems, interest, capability, and power, and then put the X's and zeros about where they are and where you want them to be, and then link them up with the nine techniques, okay? So on behalf of everyone at TGELF, I'd just like to thank Mr. Mehta for this amazing workshop. You said that sometimes the present can be an eerie echo of the past, but you also showed how the present can be enriched by the lessons of the past through this detailed and intense workshop on negotiation tactics. So uh, on that note, we'd like to give you a token of our appreciation. Teak Elf, leading the change.